Good morning, good morning, welcome back. So you should have found your uh, graded test on your paper. I've been working hard the last couple of days to try to get these things back. For some of us, that's good news. For others, we're hoping to have the weekend to not know what the grade was on the test. But generally, I think it was good news. Um, I have my answer key up here, so we're just going to pass this around. And if you want to spend a minute during class to look at your test or right after class, um, just send that around. Uh, we have a new packet, so grab one of the very thick packets that's on your table. It is 80 pages long. Uh, the reason it's longer than either of the first two packets is that the um, third packet is on uh, the third test, which is about as much material as the first test and the second test. But you can see here on the calendar that there are actually a few days um, after the first test and before the final exam. So this is the last handout that I'm giving you, but it has a little more stuff in it just because of this extra week and a half after the third test, okay? So um, we'll just take a look at the calendar to get a sense of what's coming. We just took our second test. Today we cover linear approximations. Next class we'll see a few funny theorems about differentiable functions. And then we get into chapter four. And chapter four is all about the applications of the derivative. We've spent the better part of a month just learning techniques for differentiation. We've looked at a few word problems, and on the test there was a write-in interpretation about this carbon dioxide example. But really, we've, we've got all this machinery built up. Finally, in Chapter 4, we get to see, well, how do, how do you use it? What do you do with it? So that's what's coming. Uh, we don't have a project assigned for a while. The project number 6 is going to be assigned on November 9, which is Friday, a week from today. It's sitting here on the table. If you want to take a look at it, you can grab it. Uh, but I'll give it to you guys next week, and then it will be due a while after that. Um, also, on a Friday, a week from today, is our uh, sixth quiz. So one week from today is our next quiz. And uh, just uh, one thing that's kind of funny happening next week, it won't affect us, but uh, what's happening at GCC the coming Tuesday, it's advising day. So this coming Tuesday, there are no day or evening classes. Um, on Monday, I'm going to give you a whole big spiel about why. I hope you don't just take that as a day off, but rather you come to GCC if at all possible. So I'll give you that infomercial on Monday. Um, but, 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 so that's that. Uh, and then um, not GCC related, what's happening also on Tuesday is election day. So you guys are going to go out and vote on Tuesday. If you don't know where you're supposed to vote, go to the uh, Student Life Office down in the second floor of the core. They will tell you where you're supposed to go vote. So go out and vote on Tuesday. Um, and just a note that Tuesday's vote is more than just the presidential election. There are a lot of local elections happening. There are a few different issues on the ballot depending on what town you live in. So get informed. Go out and vote on Tuesday. Um, okay, so the last thing while we've got the calendar here relates to our final exam. So um, I asked you guys to think about whether or not um, switching the final exam time was going to work for us. So uh, here on the whiteboard, I've got our information. The last day of classes is Monday, December the 17th. Officially, our final exam is the very next morning. So about 24 hours after our last class, which will be a review class, we take our exam. Um, that's 10.30 to 12.30. We could move the exam to Thursday, December 20th. On the one hand, it means that we'd have a few extra days to study. On the other hand, some of us might have conflicts. It's in the afternoon. And also, um, what else? Oh, it also means that uh, maybe your winter break starts a little bit later if you would have been finished earlier. Ross and then Tassaday? Uh, I just found out that. Okay, all right, so there's a conflict there, Tassaday? Have I misread? Do I have my dates backwards? I do have my dates backwards. Thank you. Okay, let's fix this. So uh, all I need to do is what? Change the times. So officially, our exam is Thursday, December 20th from 10.30 to 12.30. Uh, if everybody is in favor, we can move the exam to the Tuesday, 3.30 to 5.30. Okay, I'm assuming that's still a conflict for you, Ross, although you might have written down the date that I put, which was wrong. So, um, okay, so the benefits and drawbacks are the same as before. Um, the benefit of having it on Tuesday is that your winter break starts a little bit earlier, but the downside is you have lost two days of studying, preparing for this test. Um, 
versus the official time, which is Thursday, December 20th. I, did I write them correctly when I wrote them on the day of the test on that board? I wrote, I wrote what I had up here. I think I've been copying them from, what does it say up there? December 18th. So that one's right. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. So, so that that one up on the board is right. Um, in that Tuesday, December eighteenth, from three thirty is, it's the time when uh, instructors can give an exam when they have more than one section of the same class. So we wouldn't take it in here. We might take it in Stinchfield or some other big room, um, and it would be both uh, sections of mine, which is why it's a conflict for us. There's probably several sections of biology that same teacher has. Has today. All right. So the physics. Okay, so the physics exam would be right before the calc exam. All right, so uh, take a moment to think, given that I had my dates reversed. Okay, show of hands, if you'd prefer to uh, do it uh, the very next day after classes end. Show of hands, if you'd prefer to do it Thursday right after physics. Okay, so... Um, so, 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 here's how this works. I don't know how this works. I need to decide how this is going to work later today. Um, okay, so the only way that I can change it to that Tuesday in the afternoon is if, um, is if everybody's in favor. And if people are not in favor of that Tuesday afternoon, then it's up to me to make individual arrangements. And I don't feel like making individual arrangements with, um, you know, eight people in this class and about 18 people in the other class. So uh, we'll keep it with our official time. It's not a conflict for anybody. Uh, but Thursday, December 20th from 1030 to 1230. I'll say it again as we get closer to that final exam. But the calendar on the back of the syllabus then it does not have the right day or time. So you might want to make a note of that if you have that handy. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Um, so Thursday, December 20th, 1030 to 1230. All right, so um, we have our big packet that we're going to dive into. Uh, the first page is another one of these guidelines that you're going to bring with you to the test. We'll talk about it soon. I just do want to point out one thing. Do you guys see some real funny looking symbols on the right hand side of that first page? And do you see those aren't the same symbols that are on my printout up on the board? There's some fancy Greek letters on the on the printout that you guys have, but I, I have no earthly idea how that mistranslated. I mean, this is what it's supposed to look like, and this is what it looks like on my Word document, but somehow when I sent it to duplication, it um, came back with some Xs and some Psi's, and I, I don't, I'm really hoping that, that those letters don't um, litter the whole packet. I haven't looked at every page, but if you see something on the page and it's just these crazy symbols that we've never used, let me know and we'll make sure everybody gets the corrections. We're going to correct these when we get to this page. You don't have to worry about this for right now. So we're just going to skip over this. But when we come back to talking about this page, you guys can fix it all. So I don't know what happened there, but we'll fix it. But we start on page three today. All right. Um, so uh, number one is where we'll begin. And before we begin, I'll give you the nutshell version of what's happening today. Uh, the idea today is to take a function um, and plug a number into that function that would probably be hard to do without a calculator. For example, if I asked you guys to find, uh, say, f of 0.3 for this function right here, I'm really asking you to find the square root of what number? 1.3. Agree? Okay, the square root of 1.3 is quite trivial to find. You push four buttons on your calculator, I guess five, and you have it. But uh, 40 years ago, we didn't have the calculator. And so 40 years ago, this was a quite challenging problem. Um, and there are techniques for, it's called extracting roots without a calculator. It's this by hand process. It involves a lot of division. I don't know the process myself. Um, I, I missed it. Uh, the process was taught in schools until right around the time the calculators became commonplace. And then all of a sudden we have a button and we get rid of this whole process that people used to spend a lot of time on. So uh, if you ask your parents, they might know or they might have some recollection. It might send them back to the therapist. I don't know. It's, I don't think it's a nice process to do, but uh, it's something that, that people had to do up until pretty recently, just a few decades ago. So um, 
So we're going to do stuff today where we approximate the square root of 1.3, but we're not going to do it with that whole complicated process that maybe your parents went through. Um, we're going to use some calculus ideas. The ideas aren't going to be very complicated. It's going to be pretty straightforward stuff that we're going to do. But I just want to point out that this application that we're looking at, okay, it kind of became obsolete 40 years ago when the, when the calculator became commonplace. All right? So kind of interesting from a historical standpoint, not super exciting from a, oh, well, I could just type that in and it's faster than what we're about to do standpoint. All right, so we'll start with number one. David. All right, so this was similar to one of the questions on the test. And so I'll just um, caution you that, that a bunch of folks on the test, uh, when I said find the equation of the tangent line, a bunch of folks found the slope of the tangent line and stopped there. So finding the slope is important. You have to do it for this problem, but make sure you keep going. Ultimately, we're looking for the equation, y equals 3x minus 7, something like that. So work with your neighbors. See if you guys can piece through this problem. Okay, so let's check in. How do we figure out the y value at x equals 0? Plug 0 in. Now we've got a couple of functions up here, so we've got to be clear on which one we're plugging into. So where do we plug 0 in to find the y value? Then into f or f prime. To find the y value, we're plugging into the original f. So plug 0 in, and we get 1. So the point we're interested in is 0, 1. And then to find the slope of the tangent line, what do we do? Take a derivative. So this is a chain rule example. Um, I've rewritten it because I don't like negative powers and I don't like fraction powers. So I wrote it so it was more recognizable for me. And then uh, again, what number are we going to plug in for x? So I'll plug 0 in, 0 in the problem. And I get 1 half. What does 1 half have to do with the tangent line? It's the slope. So this is the slope. And then to finish this problem, there's not very much left to do, but we're after the equation of the tangent line. And so I've written down here in red two different equations for lines. Now I think that just about everybody in this room uses the first one, maybe exclusively, y equals mx plus b. For any line problem, that's the one that I think most of us go to. And that's totally fine. But for today, I'm going to use the other one every single time because it's going to head us towards a formula that actually, if you did the reading over the last couple of days, you might recognize that the formula, there's a big formula in the book in this section, and it looks an awful lot like the second equation that I've written. So I'm going to use that one for today only. Um, so uh, let's use this one, y minus, y1 is the y-coordinate of the point. How much is it? It's 1 equals m is 1 half x minus, what's the x-coordinate at the point, is 0. So that's the equation of the line. I'm going to rewrite it in a real silly way. I'm just going to add the 1 to the others, to both sides. Move this up a little bit. So if I add 1 to both sides, I get 1 half, and I'm really going to be naive here and just copy everything down. So that's the equation by just adding 1 to both sides. Okay, but nobody in their right mind would write it this way, so Let's update it so we get 1 half x plus 1. Is that the equation you guys came up with? Is that okay? So that right there is the equation of the tangent line. And I do have a picture that goes along with this, so we'll just double check that it agrees. The blue function is the square root of 1 plus x. Makes sense that it looks like that. In fact, it looks exactly like the square root function, but how is it different? Shifted how far and which way? One unit to the left. Do you see that in terms of transformation speak? You guys know that when you add one on the inside of the function, that shifts it left by one. OK, fine. So that's just the square root function shifted left. And over here is the green uh, tangent line. Now, the equation isn't written up here, but the equation of that line is the one that we just came up with, y equals 1 half x plus 1. And where is that green line tangent to the blue? at x equals 0. You can see right over there the point 0, comma 1. That's where the two of them meet. Okay, so nothing new here. But now we're going to use that equation in a way that we haven't before. So uh, let's go to number 2. We'll go to Tassaday.
Okay, so we're going to fill in this chart. Let's do the first column first. So if x is equal to 8, then I guess what we want is the square root of 1 plus 8. What is that equal to? Square root of 9, which is 3. Super. So on the blue curve that we just looked at, there's a point at 8, 3. The next one is the square root of 1 plus 3, which equals 2. So far, so good. Next one, square root of 1 plus 0, which is 1. OK. Nice numbers, easy enough to plug in. But then we get to a problem. This becomes the square root of what number? 1.3. Now, this isn't the problem to us today, but 40 years ago, this would be like a really long problem given on a test. Estimate the square root of 1.3 to the nearest thousandth decimal place. And it would be this whole process that, um, that I'm guessing few, if any, of us know. So let's take the calculator and use it. So we'll type in the square root of 1.3. But for the most part, that calculator today is going to be non-existent in our minds. So one point. Thank you. And trust me when I say that used to be really, really time consuming to find. It's easy now. We're just so we're in the mindset that this is something trivial to do. But not that long ago, it was a really long, hard problem to do that estimation. Here it's one point what? Uh, so you're giving me the answer. What am I trying to find the square root of? 1.04. Again, really hard without the calculator, but really easy with the calculator. 1.01. .01. I need, thank you. So far, so good. Okay, now we're not going to use the calculator at all as we fill in the second column. So what I want now is the y value, not for the function, not for the curve, but for the tangent line. And you guys have right here the equation for the tangent line, half of x plus 1. So when I do, I don't really have space in here, but when I do x equals 8, I'm doing half of 8 plus 1, which is 5. Everybody see what we did? Just plugging x equals 8 into this tangent line equation, half of 8 plus 1. What do we get for this next one? It's half of 3 and then plus 1. So what is that? Two point five. This isn't hard. How come a lot of people said two on that one? Oh, I see. So here we're doing half of the x, and then add one. So in this case, we get two point five. I'm I'm using a uh, good question. I am looking at uh, this picture, and I'm using that single tangent line that's only perfect at x equals zero but I'm just plugging in all these other numbers into the tangent line. Oh, in fact, here's one of them that's up on the board. Right now, x is roughly 8. You can see it. I'll go over here to use the mouse. So you can see x is uh, this point right here. It's right around 8. How much is the y value of the curve? We found it on the paper. When x is 8, how much is the, the y value of the curve? It's 3. And you can see right up there in blue, it's 3. See how I color-coded blue and blue, green and green? And then the y value of this tangent line, how much did you find for that? We found 5. And that's up there at 5. Okay? So we're just using the one tangent line, but we're plugging x equals some number into both the curve and the tangent line. So we're getting these two different y values. All right. Uh, when I plug in x equals 0, whoa. when we plug in x equals 0 into the tangent line, what do we get? We get 1. And the next one, so this one we can still do even though there's no calculators. I'm just doing half of 0.3. Easy enough, 0.15. And then we add 1 and we get 1.15. And the last one, 1.02. Half of 0.04, this one. So those are all really to do, really easy to do without the calculator, right?
Uh, yeah, it's not exactly the same, but we're seeing some numbers here that are kind of similar. So you guys have the chart in front of you. I'm going to do it up here. Um, so we've already seen that when x was 8, the real y value of the curve was 3, and the y value of the tangent line was 5, not very close to each other. Uh, 5 and 3 are two, to, 2 apart, and that's this vertical distance that I can see here. What was the next x after 8? That's 3, so I'm going to take this guy and send it closer to 3. So that's close enough there. What was the y value for the, the function, the curve? You guys found two and a half, uh, wait, for the curve was two. And then for the tangent line, that was the 2.5. 2. And you can see what's happened to this vertical distance between the two points. It's gotten a lot smaller. That's no surprise, you're approaching the place where they meet. And then when we go to x equals zero, well, what happens at x equals zero? Well, they're exactly equal. When x is 0, both the y value of the curve and the y value of the tangent line were 1. Also not a surprise, because the tangent line and the curve meet each other at the point of tangency. But then we went to x equals, what was it, 1.3? Oh yeah, x equals 0.3, thank you. So if I go to x equals 0.3, which is there, nope, missed it. If x equals 0.3, which is there, what did you guys get for the curve? 1.14, I've got 1.52, does that agree or is it off a little bit? That'd be off a little bit because there's rounding stuff. And then 1.15 was what we got before. The reason it's off is because this is not really 0.3. It might be 0.3002 or something like that. Um, but you can see the, that they're quite close to each other. They're off by less than a hundredth. Uh, and in fact, um, what happened? I was able to see the two dots here, but then... I can't distinguish them. I can't distinguish them. They're less than a hundredth away from each other. They're basically on top of each other. And then when we go even closer to zero, what did we go to? Is it 0.04? And you get two things that are, I have to count decimal places here. So how close are they? So this is a tenths, hundredths, thousandths, ten thousandths. These numbers are off by two ten thousandths. And certainly in just about any application, that's going to be um, well within the acceptable tolerance. So, um, so there's, there's not anything surprising happening here. We're just saying that the tangent line and the curve become really close to each other when you're near the point of tangency. That was this point way out here. Not surprising. But what is kind of nice, or at least what was kind of nice 40 years ago before they had the nice button for the square root, is that if you wanted to find the square root of 1.3, well, you could do a long, tedious process that, that I don't know, or you could just find the equation of a tangent line and then plug in 0.3 into the tangent line. And that's really easy. And obviously the closer these numbers are to zero, that was the point of tangency, the closer the approximation will be to the right answer. The right answer is what's the function value on the curve. The approximation is the tangent line. One other thing we can say here, and we'll write this down uh, more formally in a bit. Oh. Um, so one thing we can say is that uh, is the is the green uh, value under or overestimating the right answer, the blue one? So the green one is over. Why? What characteristic does the blue curve have that makes it so the green one is always over? It's concave down. It has nothing to do with the fact that it's increasing. It has everything to do with the thing being concave down. If you imagine a downward parabola, it's concave down everywhere. What can you say about every single tangent line at every point? It does try to get away, but does it get away? Is it always below the curve or are the tangent lines always above the curve? Yeah, for, for this downward parabola, the tangent lines are always above the curve. And if you have an upward parabola, tangent lines are always below. So it has everything to do with concavity to decide whether it's an over or underestimate. Okay, so let's come back here. Um, and we'll get, uh, Ross, can you read just the first sentence of number four? Okay, so nothing surprising. We've got a picture. We're just looking at the picture from a slightly different standpoint. Um, I had intended for us to find percent errors. Let's just write the conclusion. What happens to the percent errors when you get close to the point of tangency? They get smaller and smaller to zero. Okay. Let's try number five, and we'll go to um, Alex. Oh, 
Okay, so same process as before. Again, work with your neighbors, find the equation of the tangent line. So when we plugged x equals zero in, what was the y value? Happens to also be zero, so the origin is the point of tangency we're focusing on. The derivative, when you plug zero in, what do you get? Which is one, so that's the slope of our tangent line. And again, I'm going to encourage folks to use this version and not the y equals mx plus b version for today, just for today. y minus, how much is the y coordinate of the point? Zero. The slope, one. x minus, how much is the x? It's also zero. Okay, but we'll write it the way everybody writes it. y equals x is the equation of that tangent line. Yes? All right. So if we take a look at the picture, <clears throat> so it's the same sketchpad document. I just changed the blue function. The blue function used to be that square root. I just retyped it to be sine of x. So we get our sine of x going up and down. What's the equation of this green tangent line? Y equals x. And, um, and so if I wanted to say approximate, um, let's go to like this point right here, 6. At x equals 6, there's a value for the sine function. You can see at x equals 6, the sine function is a little below the x-axis. So it turns out to be about negative 0.27. How much is the y value of the tangent line at x equals 6? 6. Okay, it's y equals x. So the y value is also 6. Is that a good approximation? No, it's terrible. I'm estimating negative 0.27, and my estimate is 6. That, that's horrible. But why is it so bad? I'm not close to the tangent line. I got to get close to that point of tangency, which is the origin in this case. And so it's a really bad error in this, uh, like way out here. But as you get closer and closer and closer, you can see, oh, look, the points are actually now really close to each other. And so the error is not so bad. Um, so let's get our next reader. Uh, we'll go with, um, let's go with Topher for number six. It says S, sine of x. Okay, so if x is small, meaning near zero, then sine of x and x are just about the same number. So uh, sine of 0.5, you're going to type it on the calculator in a minute, but before you do, we can estimate it. Sine of x is roughly equal to x. Sine of 0.5 is roughly equal to 0.5. Okay, go ahead, type it in. Make sure we're in radian mode. So what is it actually? 0.479. Okay, that's not too far from 0.5. Sine of 0.2 roughly equals what? Without the calculator. It's 0.02. We're saying sine of x is roughly equal to x. Okay, what is it on the calculator? How many nines? Thank you. Is that close to 0 0.02? It's frighteningly close to 0 0.02. I mean, let's see, tenths, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, millions? We're off by two millionths when we estimate. And the last one, what is this roughly equal to? Negative 0.007. Sine of negative 0 0.007 is going to be really close to negative 0 0.007. This is maybe an opportunity to win some money from your friends. Ask them to ask you a sign question for something near zero, and then just be so impressed. What is this one equal to? Negative point oh oh four nines. Okay. So how far off is this from being correct? Let's see. Tenths, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, millions, ten millions, hundred millions. We're off by about six, 100 millionths. And I think the picture agrees. So this is just a new way to think about uh, the sine function. Um, I'm going to try to zoom in here. First, I'll make this square. Square. OK, so let's zoom in uh, on uh, at the origin. So we'll drag this guy over, and we're going to zoom in. OK, I, like the blue sine function, I can still see it's a little bit curvy, but only because I kind of knew it was the sine function to start. I mean, 
like the curves, you can't even see the green because it's so close to the blue. And the you know the tighter we drag this, the better the approximate. Tighter we drag where's this one? The tighter we drag it, the better the approximation is. Okay. So sine of x is very nearly equal to x when x is close to zero. Um, so I don't know if uh, what I'm about to say makes sense, but in physics, um, there's some famous formula uh, about a pendulum. And I don't remember the formula. It has to do with the length of the string and had to do with either the period, like how long it takes to make one complete oscillation, or maybe it had to do with the frequency. I think it was the period that it had to do with. There's a pi in there. There's a square root in there. I don't remember the formula. But I'm pretty sure in the derivation for the formula, uh, you end up um, thinking about the sign of some angle, like maybe how far the pendulum has swung from vertical. So there's a theta in there somewhere. And in order to get this formula, um, in order to derive this formula, you use this approximation. So, okay, if theta is near zero, then the sine of theta, which is a complicated thing in the middle of my formula, becomes just theta. And then you can deal with it. So I don't know if that, if, if does that ring a bell for, have you guys talked about pendulums at all? Okay. All right. Um, so let's go to nine. We're up to Joey. Okay, so we're going to fill in that blank right after we figure out what's going on in this formula. So first of all, our, our basic formula, I'll keep writing it in red, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So that's the one I've been wanting to use today for the equation of the tangent line. And then we're going to start replacing some things. So we'll move this up. All right, the a value is the x coordinate of the point of tangency. How much was the a value for both of the problems we just did? What was the x value for both of those problems? It was zero. So a is zero. It's a little bit confusing because there's an x in this formula. And up above, it says plug in x equals zero or find the tangent line at x equals zero. It's not this x. It's the a. OK, so let's start translating. Uh, if we have the a is the x value, how would you find the y value? Is f of a, isn't it? You take the a and plug it into the original function. So a comma f of a is the are the coordinates of the point of tangency. And then how would we find the slope? So this is the point. And then to find the slope, what, what did we find first? We found the derivative, f prime. And then we plugged a number in. We plugged in the special number we were focusing on. What is that number called in this formula? It's a. So the slope of our tangent line is f prime of a. And so if we start putting all these things together, so these two things into this equation, I go y minus, how much is the y coordinate at the point? F of a equals how much is the m slope? It's f prime of a times x minus, how much is the x coordinate? A. You get that. Which is looking very close to the funny formula up above. So all I'll do is add this uh, f of a to both sides, copying everything over there, and then add the f of a. Now I want to be really clear. This y coordinate, is it the y coordinate on the curve or is it the y coordinate on the tangent line? Now, they should be pretty close to each other if we're near the point of tangency, but which one is that? Is that a point on the curve, or is that a point on the tangent line? That's the tangent line. It's it's a line, right? It's not a curve. You, there's no sine of x in this formula. There's no square root of x in this formula. That right there is a is the equation of a line. So I'm going to be really explicit and say this is the y-coordinate of the tangent line. 
But the idea is if the point you're working on is pretty close to the point of tangency, then that formula right there should be pretty close to the y coordinate of the curve. And so the y coordinate of the curve is f of x. Uh, I would say if we thought about the limit as x went to a, this approximation gets closer and closer to the right answer. Yeah, we will see a limit today. There is one in the reading. Okay, so we're just going to highlight here the a, the a, the a is the coordinate of the point of tangency. The x appears in two places, and the x is the number whose y value you're trying to approximate from the curve. And if I can just be, um, try to put this in easiest terms, the a is the nice number in the problem, and the x is the ugly number. this up a little bit. So when I asked us to estimate sine of, um, what was the first one, sine of 0.5? Is that the first one? Yeah. So when I said sine of 0.5, was that 0.5 the nice number or the ugly number? That 0.5 was the, was it nice? Well, then the next one is like 0.0. 07 or something. That doesn't seem very nice to me. But what was the nice number for the sine curve? It was the, it was where we wanted to find the tangent line. Well, what was the nice number? It was zero. We found the tangent line at zero. Zero is the nice number in that problem. Then the ugly number is not too far away. It was 0.5 and then it was, what was the next one? 0 0.02 and then it was point, negative 0 0.007. So generally, in a problem like the, like the ones we're working on here, you're going to have a nice number and an ugly number. And you're going to plug that nice number in three times. F prime of A, X minus A, F of A. You're going to plug the ugly number in only once. You're trying to estimate F of the ugly number. All you have to do is plug it in there in the blue highlighted spot. All right. So that right there, I guess there was one more blank we said we would fill in. So uh, what is that the, uh, the equation of? That formula right there? What did we find when we went through this whole process? It was a tangent line. So the fancy formula is just another way to think about the equation of the tangent line. And I want to start giving you guys some synonyms here. You are very comfortable with the phrase equation of the tangent line. It is synonymous with the phrase local linearization. Those two things mean exactly the same thing. And the idea is that if you zoom in far enough on this blue curve, the curviness goes away, right? If when we zoomed in near x equals zero, that blue curve looked flat. It, looks to, it looked like a straight line. It looked like the tangent line. And the same thing was true for, um, for the other function, this guy right here. If I were to zoom in, let's move this over. If I, let's make it square as well. If I zoom in on x equals zero, then the curviness of the blue thing is going to become less and less significant. You can see as we, as we focus in on x equals zero, the blue thing is looking straighter and straighter. Not horizontal, but straight. Looks like a straight line. What straight line does it look like? The tangent line. All right, so let's try the problem on the next page. And we're going to see if we can use that fancy formula. OK, number 10, we are over to Ross. OK, so before we answer any of those questions, let's make sure we understand what we're trying to approximate. I want to estimate f of 1.01. OK, f of 1.01 is easy enough. We'll just plug 
1.01 for x. So we get 1.01 times 2 to the 1.01. All right, it's trivial on the calculator. You punch a few buttons and you're done. Pretend we don't have the calculator. And we had to do this thing by hand. Okay, 1.01, I understand that. I'm going to multiply, easy enough. 2 to the 1.01. What does that even mean? 2 to the 1.01. Anybody know? If you don't have a calculator in front of you, you try to understand what this 2 to the 1.01 mean. Yeah, what does that mean? Like the, the, the standard version, you know, like x squared, yeah, it means x oops, means x multiplied by itself two times, right? So we can do that with positive integer powers. I don't know what it means to multiply 2 by itself 1.01 times. Pass it Okay, so let's pause. Everybody buy what Tassaday is saying there. If I gave you this last expression, what would you do with the powers? What would you do with the powers when you saw this? You'd add them in this case, right? Keep the base, add the powers when it's a multiply in between. Okay, so that's that. And then, uh, okay, so then Tassaday, you did something else with the second per term. So say again, this is 2 to the first times. And then what did you say about this 2 to the... Cassidy says it's the hundredth root. What do we think of that? This is 2 to the 1 over 100, yes? Writing 0.01 as a fraction. And 1 over 100, oh, that's starting to look more familiar. It means the hundredth root. Good? Okay, so this problem basically boils down to uh, take 1.01, easy, multiply by 2, easy, times the hundredth root of 2. Not easy. Okay, so we've hit the wall, assuming we don't have the calculator. So what we're going to do is use this idea of local linearization. Uh, remember I highlighted two phrases in yellow on the previous page? Here's another phrase in yellow, also synonymous. Equation of a tangent line means the same as the local linearization means the same as the local linear approximation. All mean the same thing. They just mean let's get the equation of a tangent line. But instead of doing this one the same way we've done the first two, let's use that fancy formula. We've got it. Let's try it. f of x is approximately equal to f prime of a times x minus a plus f of a. Go write that formula on your index card if you don't want to try to remember it. I'd like us to be able to use it. So let's use it. Okay, I had said the a value is the nice number. What is a in this case? The nice value of a is 1. We're focusing in on x equals 1. The ugly x that we're going to use is what value? It's 1.01. So we're going to use the nice number to find information about the ugly number. That should be not too bad as long as the two numbers are close to each other, like 1 and 1.01. .01. So first, is everybody clear how to find the A and how to find the X? Any questions on that? So we're going to use the local linear stuff that we're about to do to estimate F of 1.01. .01. So the number we're trying to estimate, that's where you grab the X value. And like I said, it's generally an ugly number. OK, so let's give this a shot. I'm going to leave it as x for the time being. But I am going to replace all the a's. The a's all become what? 1. So I'm just going to write everything with 1's. f prime of 1, x minus 1, plus f of 1. OK, so now we have some work to do. Let's start here with this f of 1. f of 1 is easy. 
plug one into the original function. F of one is one times two to the one, two. Super. That part's easy. What's going to be harder for us, or more work anyway, is the f prime of one. So before we find f prime of one, what do we need to find the derivative? F prime of x. What rule do we need to use? Product rule. All right, so we've got our derivative using the product rule. There should be an ln of two floating around somewhere. Now what number are we gonna plug in for these x's? Yeah, we wanted f prime of one, you can see here. So f prime of one, one times two to the one times ln of two plus two to the one. So we get two ln of two plus one. That's what it feels like. It feels like we've just traded an impossible root function, right? Tacity told us we needed to find the hundredth root of two. We've traded it for an impossible ln function. But historically, trading for an ln was not a problem. Even before the calculator, folks were, uh, it was easy to find the ln of two. You know what reference folks had? Uh, they had slide rules. And they also, yeah, slide rule. And they also had tables of log functions. And 40 years ago, every algebra book had this big long table of log functions. The log function has been studied and it's been really well known for 400 years. So finding ln of two, not a big deal. I'd be surprised if there's a table that has the hundredth root of two somewhere in it. But ln of two is easy. Okay, we're gonna use the table that's in the calculator, but I, I want us to accept the fact that we didn't need the calculator for this back in the day, really, really well known table of values for ln. So somebody type this thing in for us and we'll get, uh, we'll put a decimal here. 3.386, is that right? Seems good to me. Um, so it's, that, that number right there is from the calculator, but I'm going to say it's from a table of logs. Because if we had the calculator, might as well just typed it in with the hundredth root from the beginning. Okay, so let's put everything together. Uh, let's highlight some more stuff. So what we just figured out is that this 3.386 is gonna go where in that equation? It's the F prime of one. So that's that. So let's put it all together. Uh, maybe we'll go green here. So this thing becomes F of X is roughly equal to, instead of F prime of one, 3.386. Times x minus one plus f of one is two. Yeah, and now finally, the only time we plug in the ugly number is here at the end. What was the ugly x we wanted? It was this 1.01? So f of 1.01. Roughly equal to, let's see, 3.386, 1.01 minus 1, plus 2. Is that easy or hard without the calculator? Instead of distributing, you can just clean up the thing in the parentheses. What is it? It's 0.01. Oh, multiplying something by 0.01, that's easy. 0.003386 or 10, 0. 0.03386. So without a calculator, we can do this. If you feel like typing it in, that's okay. But the point is, with a little bit of time, we could find this no problem. F of 1.01, roughly equal to 2.03. Okay, I'll leave it as a 386. So without a calculator, only armed with that table of logs, we've got our approximation. What would I like to compare this to, given that we have the calculator? 
yeah, why don't, why don't we just do what we couldn't do from the beginning, this purple plugging it in. Before we do one quick observation, I'd really like us to know going into this whether we're going to have an over or under estimate. Um, this function right here, uh, the, the 2 to the x, this guy right here. Remember, the only thing that determines whether it's going to be an over or under estimate is the concavity. All right, so imagine 2 to the x. Can you draw that in the air? y equals 2 to the x. All right, so we've got this exponential growth function. So it's increasing. And then draw y equals x. That's our 45 degree diagonal line. And so if I multiply these two things that are increasing, well, it's going to increase even faster than it increased before. So what do you think about the concavity of that function? It's going to be concave up. I mean, it's going to be even more concave up than 2 to the x was, if that makes sense. So um, now something funny might happen in the negatives, but I'm really only looking at x equals 1, so I feel pretty confident this is concave up. And if the graph is concave up, where are the tangent lines? Are they above the curve or below the curve? Below. So is our approximation, which is this number here in green, going to be more or less than what we're about to get for the purple? It's going to be less. Okay, so let's type this into the calculator. And what do we get? One .01 times 2 to the 1.01. Again, Ross? Thank you. Okay. Was our green estimate under? Yes, it was, because the tangent lines are all under this curve, whatever it looks like. Um, okay, and how close was it? Let's see, tenths, hundreds, thousandths. We were off by less than one one thousandth, which is a, a quite acceptable percent error. All right, any questions on that? Okay, so um, moving on, uh, let's fill in the blanks here. If a function is concave up, the linear approximation, does it under or overestimate? Function is concave up, imagine the tangent lines are all underneath, so it under underestimates. And if your curve is concave, down, then the tangent lines are all above, so the linear approximation, the tangent lines overestimate. Okay, so moving on to 12, we're going to define this new word called error, and the local linear approximation is given by that crazy formula. But the formula is actually quite reasonable if you understand what's going on. Uh, if I asked us to find the error, let's say, in the bottom one of this table here, how would you find the error between the correct answer of 1.0198 and the estimate of 1.02? Find the difference. So we subtract them, right? Um, and so we subtract the, the right answer minus the approximation. Well, I think that's exactly what this formula does. F of x is the right answer. All of this gobbledygook was the tangent line approximation. So all we're doing is subtracting the right answer minus our estimate. And we'll give that guy a name. We'll call that E of X for the error function. And if X gets closer and closer, so here are our X's on this column here. If they get closer and closer to the point of tangency, the, the nice point that we're focusing on, in this case, x equals 0 was where we found the tangent line. What happens to the error? Smaller and smaller. Towards what number? 0. So we can fill in that blank. This is number 13. It says the limit as x goes to a, that is the ugly number goes towards the nice number, the error goes to 0. But our tangent approximation does even better than just saying it makes the errors go to zero. Could you imagine, uh, so if we were to think about this picture that we've looked at a few times now today, uh, I'm going to graph a new line here, new function. Now my new function is going to be y equals 1. Why don't I see my function? What? Okay, there's y equals 1. Forget the tangent line up here. 
as x gets closer and closer to the point of tangency that's still there, even though I've hidden the tangent line, what happens to the error between the, the right answer, which is blue, and the red answer, which is always 1? What happens to that error? It approaches 0. Agree? But I don't think y equals 1 is a particularly good way to approximate that function. Yeah, it goes to 0, but it doesn't go very quickly. Um, I, can, I can try to play our zoom in game here. Does it look, you know, any better zoomed in? No, I mean, it still, it still looks pretty bad, doesn't it? And if I zoom in some more, well, gosh, I can still tell these two functions are quite different. And you can zoom in as much as you want, and they'll always look different, right? So, so our tangent line does better than just saying makes the errors go to zero. This is a little, little bit tricky. It's not something I'm going to test you on, but, but I want to point it out. It turns out that this limit right here is also zero. So let's think about this limit. E of x is the error function. And we're going to divide by x minus a. Let's come back to this guy. OK. So um, what can you guys tell me about uh, the error as we approach this way? All right, it's getting smaller. The distance between them is getting smaller. But I want to compare that to the distance between the current x, which is that orange point in pink, and the x at the tangent point, which is the origin here. What's happening to that distance? It's also getting smaller. OK, wait, so we've got two competing things here. I'm trying to compare uh, the distance between the, the right answer and the tangent line answer. So that's the error. And we're trying to compare that to, OK, but how far apart, how far am I from the point of tangency? And it turns out that this fancy limit that we've got here is 0. That is to say, I've got two uh, pieces for that fraction. They're both going to 0. But I want to know which one's going there faster. If I tell you that that fraction actually still goes to zero, then which one of the zeros really goes to zero faster? If you have a fraction that's approaching zero, what can you say about the how the numerator and denominator relate to each other? Well, the denominator goes to zero. I mean, like as we squeeze in, that distance on the x-axis does go to zero. But the top goes to zero a lot faster. That's what this says. The only way you're going to have a fraction that's going to zero is if the top goes to zero much faster than the bottom. That is to say, the bottom is still pretty big compared to the top. If you have a fraction where the bottom is pretty big compared to the top, well, that fraction is going to be near zero. And so you can actually even see it a little bit in this picture. I'm comparing this error distance with the distance between there and the origin. Which one is bigger? bottom distance, the, the x distance. So right now I've got a fraction where the top part, that vertical error, is smaller than the bottom part. But it's still true even as we go in, oops, even as we go in this way. Okay, so the error in the functions is really tiny, a tiny vertical distance that I can't even really see. And okay, we're still, we've still got some space left. So that error goes to zero even faster than the, the horizontal, how far you are from the Special point. Uh, it's true. Um, it's true near the nice number. So x is approaching the nice number, the point of tangency. So as you get closer to that point of tangency, the vertical error is a whole heck of a lot smaller than the horizontal distance. So the amounts are smaller. Yes. But They're both going to hit zero at the same time. But remember, for a limit, we don't actually. We're not allowed to plug in the actual nice number. We can only look nearby. And nearby, that top thing is always going to be smaller, significantly smaller than the bottom part. You know, it's interesting. Um, so I had never thought of this question, and, uh, and Topher is asking it. And in my first class, Abby asked that question, can we see it? And so, um, so I've, I've drawn something else in here based on her question. So this guy right here is this fraction. Let me just show you the pieces. Uh, maybe I can make this a little bit bigger. That's not it. I don't remember how to make the thing bigger. OK, well. Um, 
So this guy right here is the f of x, that's the right answer, the right y value, minus the tangent line approximation, which is this. Don't get thrown off by the equals. That equals is part of the name I gave to this function. So this is all, this is just saying, take the right answer, subtract the, the green number up here. That's the vertical distance on top. And on the bottom, it's x minus a. And that's what I've graphed here in red. And so take a look uh, at, um, at uh, this guy right here. It's got a y value, which maybe is somewhere floating around. It's this one right there. So that guy right there, I used to know how to make this thing bigger. I don't remember anymore. Um, oh, wait. No, I don't remember. No. <laughs> um, okay, so this guy right here is a negative 0.17. What that means is that if you take this vertical distance and you divide by the horizontal distance, you get negative 0.17. Okay, and as we move the point closer and closer to the point of tangency, what's happening to this guy right here? It's getting closer and closer to zero, and you can actually see the red curve. Looks like it goes through what point? It looks like it goes right through the origin. So even there, you know, I've got this, I've got a little bit of distance there, but I've got nothing. I can't even see the vertical distance anymore. And so, yeah, it looks like uh, looks like we go right through. It's undefined. Um, Don had said, you know, like, can we plug in x equals zero? And you can't just plug in x equals zero, but if you plug in something real close, uh, you see the, the red curve looks like it goes right through the origin. So, um, so that funny looking fraction goes to zero. All right, again, that is not something I'm gonna test you on. Um, so, so don't get super concerned about this part right here, but, uh, just kind of uh, thinking about things and thinking about um, you know, what does it mean to approximate well? And that's the formal way to think about that. Okay, um, um, um. all right, so uh, there were a few people I wanted to talk to. So let me just say this and then we'll call it a day. Uh, homework is in the usual place on the next page. Um, so if, uh, if, 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 so on the test that I just handed back um, on the, uh, first page on the inside of the first page is where I wrote all of your percentages, right? Your homework grade, your questions of the day, your quiz average, your project average. Even if you don't count homework in your grade, I still put it. So some of you have some laughably low numbers in those, but that's okay if they don't count. You know, getting a 5% homework grade is not a problem if it doesn't count. Um, so I crunched all those numbers together, and then in the bottom middle of that table, I wrote, here's what your grade would be if the course ended today. Um, in order to pass this course, to get credit for the course, I'm going to stare at the back wall while I say this so nobody feels like I'm talking to them. But to pass the course, you um, need to get a D, which in my class is a 63 or higher. Um, in order to continue on to Calc 2, a D is not going to cut it. The prerequisite for Calc 2 is a C minus or better in Calc 1, and a C minus or better in my class is a 70. So if your number is anything, say, below 72, 73, we should have a conversation. Um, I think that... Uh, there's still time left for people's grade to improve. There's also time left for people's grade to fall. But if you're in that kind of danger zone, we really should talk about um, your chances for success and your options at this point in the semester. The last day to withdraw from a course at GCC this semester is November 9th, which is one week from today. So it's a conversation that, that I'd like to be a part of. You can talk to your advisor if you're at all thinking about it. But anyway, if your number is anywhere there in the 73 or lower range, you're kind of in my warning zone, so so maybe we can have a conversation either right now or, or Monday or sometime soon. Topher. Yeah, a week from today is the last day to withdraw. Does it include the grade you get? So if you withdraw from a course, any course, uh, what happens on your transcript at this point in the semester is you would see a W next to, say, Calculus 1. It wouldn't count as anything in your GPA, but it would be there on the transcript as a W. Um, GCC also has a policy where if you retake a course, you can replace a bad grade with a better grade. So if you take this and you get a C- minus or a D and you want to take it again and you get a B, then the C minus or D gets taken away. It's still on the transcript, but it doesn't appear in the GPA calculation. It would get replaced with the B. Okay, so um, so we'll end a full 20 seconds early today. Um, so don't say I never do nothing for you. Uh, so have a wonderful weekend. Like I said, homework is there. We'll see you guys on Monday.